Today we're going to hear from Claire Haley, who's going to talk to us about her PhD research. There will be time for some questions at the end, and just to remind everyone that we are recording the seminar and it'll be posted online in the next few days. Over to you, Claire. Claire Haley, I'm a PhD researcher here in the CFPR. I'm also an architect and an associate lecturer in architecture here at UWE, and a designer maker with a background in jewellery making. Um, my, I'm going to talk to you today about my PhD. Um, my design and making practice has a focus on materiality and the use of digital tech. And this image here is a, a necklace that I finished recently, which is made from 0.8 mil plywood, which has been laser cut. Um, and that kind of feeds into my PhD. So my PhD is titled Ply Could. And it's an exploration of the use of thin plywood. By that I mean 0.8 mil or 1.5 mil thick material, which is typically European birch. Uh, I source it from Europe because it's easier to um, track the, the sustainability credentials of the material. Um, and it's made up of three layers of birch veneer with the top layer and the bottom layer running in the same direction with the grain running in the same direction and the middle layer with the grain running perpendicular which gives extra strength to the material i love ply i think it's a, an amazing material partly for that reason the fact that it is um, engineered in that way makes it very strong and lightweight um, but also i think it's absolutely beautiful and it is a sustainable material so plywood in recent years has had a real resurgence in the construction industry it's been used on a very large scale in place of steel and concrete for the frames of buildings and this graph here explains why that is it's because it seemed to be a more sustainable alternative to concrete or steel so when you look at this graph there's the two green bars on the left they, th this graph is showing embodied carbon of various materials and comparing them to each other. The two green bars on the left are for plywood, and the reason there are two is because one of them is a hugely negative figure, and that's because it's been adjusted to allow for the carbon stored within the trees as they grow. This has been questioned. This, these figures have been questioned a little bit recently, um, largely because that figure has been arrived at based on the assumption that we use the whole of the tree, which of course we don't. So I think probably there's a more accurate figure that's somewhere between the two, maybe just below zero, which is why I've put both of them on there. But regardless, it's still going to be lower than concrete and steel, which is why it's being used in the construction industry. But what interests me more is all of the bars on the right hand side, so the aluminium and all the dark blue ones, which are all plastics. So plywood is considerably better in terms of embodied energy um, than aluminium or any of those plastics. But yet we don't really use it. It's a very underused material on this really thin scale. I buy mine from model making suppliers and that um, seems to be the only place that it's really used. We used to use it a lot in architectural model making, but um, even that doesn't really happen now because we tend to 3D print our architectural models. So it doesn't have a lot of use, but it's sustainable. So this, that's the kind of reasoning for my PhD research. In terms of how the PhD is structured, it's very much a, a hands-on practice-based PhD. I've been doing a lot of making, a lot of playing with plywood, and it's taken the form of a series of experiments or material investigations, as I've called them, uh, which are themed so I've kind of taken a theme and done lots of experimentations along that theme. So I'm going to do, there's a few quick slides about the, those themes and then one of them I'm going to go into in a little bit more detail. Um, and the really nice thing about working with this really thin plywood is that it's quite soft and bendy and you can soften it further by applying heat and moisture and that makes it really flexible and then you can pull it down over a former, leave it to dry and cool, and then it will set into shape. Um, and because I'm working relatively small, I can make those formers using 3D printing technology really, really easily. So this is 
one of my material investigations, my experiments, um, which is all about kerfing. So those of you that don't are not familiar with woodworking, the term kerfing just means that uh, it, it's a term used when you're cutting slices out of or notches out of a piece of wood so that you can bend it. And the nice thing about what I'm doing is I'm able to combine the kerfing with the activation, the, uh, the application of the moisture and the heat in order to soften it and then set it. So the, the two come together quite nicely. So there's quite a lot of potential there. I've also looked at weaving. So in a similar way to how you might work with willow that had been soaked and softened, I'm, I've cut the plywood into strips and then softened it and used it to weave. Um, this one's been quite an interesting one that's got a lot of potential. I think I'll, I'll be taking further. So this is a process of scoring. So to cut the plywood, I use the laser cutter. And by adjusting the settings on the laser cutter, rather than cutting it, I can score just through one of the three layers, which means I can then soften it and bend it uh, almost like origami to get these folded forms. And there's quite a lot of potential there for making 3D shapes, which is really interesting. This is the one I'm going to talk about in more detail. So this is looking at the springiness of the material. And what I mean by that is if you um, set it into a curved form, if you then squash that form, it will go back to straight. And when you let go, it will spring back to, the, to its curved form. So it's got this natural springiness in it, which is really interesting and has got a lot of potential, which I wanted to explore. This was the inspiration. These rather grainy images were the inspiration for that bit of research. These images are from Chicago Institute of Design. And during the Second World War in America, industry was banned from using metals because all the metal was needed for the war effort. And at the same time, the American lumber industry was being promoted as a growing industry in the US. So Chicago Institute of Design developed these timber springs that they actually referred to. They were so successful, they called them unbreakable wooden springs. Um, and they were, uh, industry actually adopted them and they were used. And these are made just of straight wood, not, not of engineered wood, not of plywood. So if you can make something like this out of straight wood, you can definitely make it out of plywood, which has got that extra strength. So I thought I'd have a go. Um, and I began by experimenting with lots of different spring forms to see what shapes I could make, softening the plywood and putting it into formers, and just playing with springs once I'd got them made to see how successful they were. And from that, I narrowed it down to three spring forms that seemed to have the most potential. So there's the spiral springs on the left, the I-shaped ones in the middle, and the zigzag ones on the right. And you can see in the images, you can also see the 3D printed formers that I've used to make the springs. Um, now, I wanted to be really uh, thorough with the way that I was testing these and get some really good quantitative data out of the process. So I've made each of them. Obviously, I've got the two different thicknesses of materials. So I made each of them in the two different thicknesses. And I'd already become acutely aware of the importance of the direction of the grain when I was cutting these. It, it had a huge effect on the way that the pieces were performing. So I also made each of them along the grain and across the grain. So that gave me 12 different springs in total. Now the spiral springs cut across the grain actually, for reasons I'll explain later, were not particularly useful. So I discarded those, which took me back down to 10 spring types. And because I wanted to be really thorough with my testing, I made five of each one. So this is my completed box of springs, 50 of them. And they've all got a unique number. Um, they've all been logged and um, coded so that I can uh, refer back to them when I need to. And then I took this box of springs into the engineering department. And with their help, I tested them in the machine, which is in the picture on the bottom right. And what that does is it applies a load and it records the load applied, and it also records the amount of compression, the distance that the spring has been compressed by, which means that you can map the load against the compressive distance, as I have done in the graph on the left. 
And this gives you an idea about the performance of the spring. The steeper the curve, the stiffer the spring. So each one of my 50 springs I tested at least five times. So I got an average for each spring. And then with because I had five of each spring type, I was then able to get an average for each spring type. And obviously they were all slightly different because wood's a natural material, so they're going to perform slightly differently. And there is a degree of hand making in them, which is also going to make them all unique. But it did mean that I'd got some really strong quantitative data that I could use to compare the different spring types. So what I found was the I-shaped ones gave me, they were took a really, really heavy load, but they didn't have very much deflection, compressive distance on them. And at the other end of the spectrum, the spiral ones deflected, compressed a lot, but didn't take very much load. They were very soft. And the zigzag springs were quite a good compromise in the middle, which was really, which felt like it had the most potential. And when I looked at the figures of the weights that it was taking, it seemed quite viable that if I had a cluster of them, I could make something strong enough to take the weight of a person. So that's what I decided to do to um, take the experiment forward. So this is the making process. So the first sample that I made was A4 size. It had 16 springs in it. And the springs were made by laser cutting, softening them, and then joining them. In the end, I joined them with a combination of glue and stitching because just stitching, I found it really hard to get a really tight joint. So I glued them first to get a tight joint, and then I was able to, to pull the stitching really tight and, and get a really good solid joint. And it, it turned out to be a good thing that I'd done both because when I took it back to the engineering department and put it back in the testing rig, there was all these horrible cracking, splintering sounds, and I thought I'd completely trashed the sample. But then I took it out, and it was still perfectly intact. And I think what was happening was the glue was popping and, and splitting, but the stitching stayed in, in place, so the sample was still completely viable and usable. And it worked. It took the weight of a person. Um, and you can see here, and obviously this isn't in the testing group, but you can see what happens with the weight of a person applied to it. The springs flatten out take on a straighter line, and then when the load is removed, they spring back and go back into their original for curved form. So while I was doing all of this, I, I kept a reflective diary and I logged everything that I was doing, um, and there were some really interesting observations that came out of it all. Looking at the, the zigzag springs, I'd anticipated that the, the firmest ones, the stiffest ones, would be the ones made from the 1.5 mil thick material. And it's true that the, the stiffest one was the 1.5 cut along the grain. But the second stiffest was the 0 0.8 cut along the grain. And then the 1.5 across the grain came in third. So the direction of the grain was having more effect on the stiffness of the spring than the thickness of the material which is obviously something that's going to be really useful to know for me moving forward when I'm making things with this material. Also, because I had quite a production line going, making all these springs, it gave me an opportunity to try out lots of different methods for softening the plywood. I started with a very traditional steaming approach. I tried soaking in boiling water. I boiled it in the microwave. And then I also had a go at putting it in a pressure cooker. And this turned out to be the best way for me because I'm working on quite a small scale. It's quite easy to do. It's quite controllable. And the advantage it had over um, boiling it was that it didn't get it too soggy. And what that meant was it didn't take quite as long to dry. All, all the methods worked. They were all effective, but this the pressure cooker was the most effective way. So this is the way that I'm working now moving forward. Um, and this was the, another slightly unexpected finding. So I mentioned earlier that the spiral springs that were cut across the grain were not particularly useful. And you can see in the image on the left why that is. So those four spirals there, they were all made using the same former. But the two tight ones are cut along the grain and the two loose ones are cut across the grain. They opened out so much when they came off the former that they weren't really usable. So 
offer anything practical. Um, but interestingly, that didn't happen with the zigzag springs, which were this kind of S shape. So, so where the curve was all in one direction, they opened out. But when I had a curve and then a counter curve, they didn't. And that's going to be really useful for me moving forward when I'm making, because it could mean that simply by introducing a counter curve into the design of things that I'm making, I could create a stability in the form that could be really useful. So just to finish off the um, experiment, I decided to make one more sample because my A4 size one wasn't quite big enough to sit on. So I made one that was the size of a seat cushion. So this one is 300 by 300 square and it's got 24 springs in it. And again, there's a little video of it in action with somebody sitting on it. These springs flattening themselves down straightening themselves out and then springing back up again. So that was that experiment. This is the one that I'm working on now, my latest one. Uh, and this is all about taking um, a standard size flat sheet and making it into a bowl vessel shape. So I'm working at the moment just with a 0.8 mil material and a 175 by 175 square, which is the optimum size to fit in my pressure cooker and um, cutting it and working it in different ways to get very different forms. I think there's probably almost an infinite number of ways of doing this. And this is just the beginning of, of my explorations. But the So the one on the left has been curved and then set on a 3D, it's been softened and then set on a 3D printed former. Um, the second one, is actually not been softened at all. So that's just been laser cut and it's the weight, it's its, it's own self weight that's giving it the bowl shape. So that one can be dismantled and flat packed back down again. The one in the middle has also been cut on the laser cutter and then shaped using a 3D printed former. The um, fourth one has been scored. So where you can see the red lines on the square, there's a score line there and then it's been softened and folded and it's actually just held in place with a, a friction joint um, with a little peg on the corner of each one. And then the one on the right has been laser cut and then softened and it's been pulled together around the, the holes and held in place initially with a piece of wire and then once it's set the wire was removed and it was sewn together with a single stick. So like I say I think there's probably limitless ways of doing these. My plan in the not too distant future is to run a knowledge exchange workshop where I will share some of my some of what I've learned and some of the skills that I've learned by doing a demonstration on one of these I don't know which one one of these and then give people a chance to have a go themselves and then hopefully share with me their ideas and thoughts about what else I could do with this material and how else I could work it if you are interested in getting involved in a workshop then that's my contact details are there. Please do get in touch. Um, and then just one last comment, the one on the right here, which doesn't look very anything special, particularly in that image. It's specifically designed so that a number of them can be joined together to make a larger vessel. And that's my final slide. That was lovely, Hayley. Thank you. Um, and I love um, I was just thinking about the, I think we might have talked about it before, about the sort of zero waste pattern making in um, in fashion industry. And the last one especially reminds me of those sort of Japanese zero waste patterns mm. of taking a sheet and then, you know, folding it in without um, any kind of additional parts or anything. Um, yeah, so I have been looking at that and actually the brief that I've written for that vessels project one that there is a statement on there saying trying to ma maximize the whole sheet and obviously not all of the examples that I've done do maximize it but yeah it's kind of a goal if you like yeah it looks beautiful and I like the way they um, slot together as well um just an another question about um how is your questionnaire going oh um I haven't checked it recently I need to check that again I should have put the barcode on here, shouldn't I? Yeah. <laughs> in the chat. I like everyone in the room's done it, but you know, just as a little uh, plug there. 
Thank you. Um, that was cool, thanks. Uh, your springs and indeed the other, your springboard sort of thing, your mm -hmm. you know, gets all of the form. How well does this method of kind of uh, moisturizing and warming and then drying keep? How good is the memory or how good is the hysteresis? So if you like leave them, if, if I was to sleep on it, let's say, and crush it, fade as a gel, yeah, come back to how it was quite. I mean, it's, uh, it, uh, the samples that I made have, have only been in existence for six months. So, um, but what I did discover when I tested them was that the and because I, I actually measured it as a as a record when I was putting them in the rig, the first two or three times of compressing, they lost some height, right, and then it stabilised. Okay. So I, I lost about seventeen percent of the height in the first three goes, and then it stabilised from that. Okay. Um, uh, this one. I mean, that could be kind of movement within the stitch. It's something kind of... It could be, but I stable. think based on other things I've made, I think it's probably just a softening of the lignans and the kind of yeah. stabilising support. Cool. That's nice that it stabilises that for a while. Mm. And then it just, as far as you know, stays As far as I know, it stays. Cool. It is, yeah. And there's no reason really why it should go back unless it had the heat and moisture applied to it again. Yeah. So if you're in a, a hot, humid country, then it might be more likely. Well, I guess. Yeah, I was going to say, if you have six months, we're about to go into winter. So yeah. I think it might go. Uh, quite a lot of the stuff that I've made, um, like the bowls, I've, I've sealed them with hard wax oil after they're finished, just in case that happens. But I did do some testing early on just with strips um, to see how they responded to humidity. And that in the time, I, I just... Um, logged their movement, I had them on a graph and logged them, their movement and how much they uncurled over the course of about three weeks. And after the initial spring back, there wasn't much uncurling at all. Nice. And this is, is this birch? Birch, right? yeah. yeah. And there's that thing, so there's something this is probably, uh, maybe since the beginning, I had always thought maybe there's an engineer work it change the yeah. direction between yeah, they do so it, a true plywood has it at 90 degrees so the stuff i'm working with is three layers of veneer and the top layer and the bottom layer are running in the same direction and the middle one is perpendicular right, okay uh, um with the you said you got the 0.8 and point 1.5 1.5 um, so they're both made up of three plies, yeah. so the veneers are thicker. Can you get 0.5, can you keep the veneer layer the same, so have more, why do you pick three? Is that out of choice or because of what's I, available? I wanted it to be at least three because otherwise it's not true plywood. Yeah. Um, and, and because I'm working with thin stuff, it is three, so it's kind of all it goes down to. But it makes it quite different to work with and thicker plywoods because the of course the proportion speaking it's two thirds one way and a third the other way which if you've got more layers is less pronounced and I think that's one of the reasons why it bends so well in one direction well it's certainly why the grain is that the direction of the grain is so influential in what I'm doing I think so it's in your advantage for it to only be three as well yeah I think, I think so yeah and um you said the pressure cooker method was the most successful. Mm. Um, how do you sort of what were you measuring against the time We've, and just it results? was it was a bit of everything. It was what was easy to do, um, and the timing wasn't much different between the different methods, to be honest. Um, and they all worked. The steamer worked. The, the soaking in boiling water worked, but the pressure cooker seemed to get it even softer. Um, because I guess it got it that bit hotter as well. Um, and it just didn't get it as so so what before I tried the pressure cooker, I've been boiling it in the microwave. And that worked, but it got it really wet, which means when you put it putting it into a 3D printed form, sometimes it'd take two days to dry. Whereas the pressure cooker was getting it really soft without getting really soggy. So it was it was drying quicker. Really I wonder if whether the pressure is sort of making it penetrate further into the centre of the wood as well. I think so, yeah. I think, I think it's getting the real heat and moisture right into the centre rather than just on the surface. Pretty interesting. How are the layers of plywood fused together? They're glued, yeah. And that is the 
that's the one slightly challenging thing about plywood and sustainability but there is um moves to improve that so at the moment most of the glues have formaldehyde in them but there is a company in Finland which is making a plywood now which is made I think about 60 or 70 percent of the glue is lignin based and they make it from their own sawdust and waste material um, that seems to be the way forward so as that increases then that becomes a more sustainable thing. so if you burn this piece because that's what I was thinking like in a, in a way you're creating something you could could be a blue source mm. later yes whereas silver you can recap yeah. it again and again this could just be another way of but yeah. can it is it okay to yeah to just yeah. line up with the game yeah. yeah that's fine. yeah and have you thought about color because of course I love the green of the wood like it's really beautiful but I've just started to look at color so the first image um and your ring as well is that a color yes yeah, so so this has got different colored ring uh, loops in it um but it's just been stained so i actually just saw something on instagram where somebody made a wood stain by putting wire wool and vinegar and then just using that as a stain so that these have been stained just using that and the longer you leave it the darker the stain becomes um so yeah, I'm just starting to explore that. I don't really want to go down the bright coloured route because I think it takes away from the natural quality of the material. I'm wondering if there's something to be done with the steaming process, whether you could apply something else in that process and allow Maybe. the steam to transfer yeah. colours through. Yeah. Something that's also... I mean, the colour does change when you steam it, I've mm -hmm. noticed. So obviously when it comes out of the laser cutter, it usually has a black charred mm -hmm. edge. Um, that disappears when you steam mm. it and the colour uh, kind of darkens slightly when you steam it, even, even after drying. If you have a piece that's been steamed and dried and a piece that's straight from the factory, they're completely different colours. Mm. Yeah, it'd be nice to dye it with other wood sources mm. or something. Like leaves or something. If you yeah. put them, if oh, leaves yeah. or something, yeah. put yeah, them yeah, in the steaming. Yeah, a really beautiful range of yeah. browns and yeah, and all autumn's coming. Perhaps I should collect some of leaves and have a go. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, can make them. Yeah. Something nice about the, um, the urbanisation to the wire and vinegar is that it's it's doing natural things. So it's like yeah. bringing out the tapas as well as changing the colour of the patterns. Um, so it'd be quite interesting to see what happens with that in the, in the steamer, that liquid. Yes, yes, I try that as well. That's the surface thing, it's like, like as much as the stuff penetrates so it'd be interesting to see how like, deep that penetrates and that would tell yeah it would tell me how deep the steam was yeah if you, gone. if you cut it across after you've done it yeah it might give you an indication of how far it is penetrating yeah. and it's a visual thing yeah i should try that thank you okay that's why i do it today <laughs> the steaming is is see like softening the lignans but then if it's got that stuff but it's also like there's a talent so like doing tannin yeah. lignin on yeah the yeah yeah, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about application because I know that you've made alongside your material experiments, you've made a lot of objects just yeah. to sort of test your different techniques in, in different. Yeah, I haven't got any examples on the images, but uh, I've got this kind of extra experiment that's running alongside my other ones, which I've, I've referred to as um, application of knowledge. And basically, what I'm doing is if I see an object, that I think I could make out of plywood and I can go. <laughs> and some have been more successful than others. Um, but I made, what have I made? You might need to remind me, Laura. I made a glasses case, uh, a hair clip. Um, what else? What else have I made? I was thinking the glasses case and the, yeah. the spring, the spring yeah. hair clip. Yeah. And obviously your vessels. Yes. Vessels. Yeah. Yeah, so again, if, if you think, I, I was thinking of trying to make a phone cover as well possible so yeah if you think if you can think of anything i might be able to make that plywood set me the challenge i'll have a go so it could be out of point eight yeah <laughs> Great, I think that's it. Thank you very much everyone for your questions and thank you Claire for a very interesting question today. The next one is in two weeks which is Laura Clark on um printmaking. So we hope to see you then. Thank you very much. Thank you.